practice of the freedom-centered mindset has implications that affect all of our lives, and not just when you're climbing the mountains of the world. I'm going to speak today about courage and how we, how I actually and my colleagues use courage to overcome fear. Fear in the workplace shows up in very, very different ways. And one of the ways, of course, is, and we pretend that it isn't so, through anger, through inability to make decisions, and in our own lives, it shows up in a very different way. We take issue with people. We take issue with challenges that appear when we are moving towards the peak or the pinnacle of our own dreams. 19 years ago to this day, I climbed my first mountain, or should I say my first serious mountain, Mount McKinley in Alaska. The earlier mountain, just a year before, that I climbed was Mount Rainier. On day 13, we were facing the West Buttress, a very steep section of very hard blue ice. I was wearing crampons, strap-on crampons, that in fact I'd also worn on Rainier. As a rookie, I didn't realize that I'd need to strap them on much tighter because of the steepness of the slopes on the Alaska mountain. When we got to one of the most challenging sections, I knew that something was wrong. I'd lost traction on my right boot. With a heavy pack, I bent down gently to look and see what was going on. And in that moment, the pressure and the slope and the torque released the crampon on my left boot as well. I was sliding backwards and even though my safety equipment held me in place, my body was riddled in fear. The unimaginable had happened. What to do? I'm on the slope with a 55-pound backpack attempting to stay on my feet. Steep slope, hard ice, gusty winds, seemed like an impossibility. In that moment, I realized that the fear that I was experiencing was preventing me from doing what I needed to do. Internally, I had a little flash that said, Relax, breathe, think of what's the next thing that has to happen. And as a result, I attempted to get my crampons back in place. And you might say, why not just bend down, lift your leg, slide your crampon back in. I tried this over and over and over, but I could not retain my balance. There was just no possible way of doing this. The other little thought here was, what about the three people that are on my same rope, that because of their inactivity, they are shivering in the intense cold and are impatient to get going again? To this moment, I can remember that feeling of frozenness that actually locked me into a solid block of, of ice. Approximately 40 minutes later, sweating profusely and every muscle stretched to the extreme, I was ready to climb again. The mindset of freedom has everything to do with courage. 
courage to first of all feel your fear. Secondly, to not go into panic. And if you do, not to be immobilized by the fear. And also to bring yourself back to the calm and ask yourself, what do I have to do now? In this more rational state, of course, the answers that we receive have a much greater likelihood of helping us out of the predicament. My climbing and observing myself and my reactions in very adverse conditions, plus experiencing how I interacted with fellow climbers, led to some very profound personal lessons. Lessons that I did not learn at MBA school, nor during my time as a leadership trainee, nor in the 15 years that I ran my own service and manufacturing company, and especially not in the 25 years, I should add, my first 25 years as a corporate consultant. I assess these lessons to be so significant that I felt I was compelled to pass them on. For if I didn't, I would be robbing the people that could be benefiting from these same experiences. On my first such learning adventure to Everest Base Camp, actually, in one of the most beautiful scenes on this planet, I had a young lady by the name of Lisa, who really was a thriving business person. On day two, I was behind with some of the slower trekkers. We were approaching a suspension bridge, a 600-foot suspension bridge, over a very steep gorge with very fast rushing glacial water. As we approached the bridge, I realized there was a commotion. Lisa was in tears. The other members were around her saying, don't be afraid, it's okay, it's safe. Thousands of people have crossed this bridge before. There's nothing to be afraid of. I quickly realized that speaking to Lisa when she was in this state of mind was completely futile. I asked them to step back, well-meaning as they were, and to give us some space because I realized as long as we were speaking at her from a rational perspective and she was in this irrational state, again, completely futile. They stepped back. Empathically, I said to Lisa, this really scares you. She said, yes, yes, I can't do this. I'm going back, I'm going back. I said, I understand. And what I'd like you to know is that we're all rooting for you. We all want you to be part of the rest of the, the climb. You're part of this team. She said, no, no, I'm going back. Tears were flowing and she was really in, in quite a state. I said to her, before you do that, I would like you to do something with me. Are you game? Hesitatingly, she said, yes. I said, okay. What I want you to do is follow exactly what I'm doing and also make the same intonations and the same sounds. And before she could say anything, I moved into my role. Fortunately, she followed. Approximately a minute later, we were both, both somewhat breathless. I said to her, I want you to lock into my eyes and I want you to follow me as I step backwards. I was praying she would. Courageously, in fact, she did. Partway across the bridge, put my hand on her shoulder and said, Lisa, we're perfectly safe. We're partway across the bridge. Would you like to look around? You can imagine the joy and the, the hoops and the hollering as she was approaching the, the end of the bridge. For the last half and for the next four bridges on the way in, she was still a little bit on the timid side, but she didn't need me anymore. The cycle of fear had been broken, and she transformed herself into a different space. 
The lesson, very simple. It takes courage to be open to other possibilities, to not be a lone ranger, to not let your ego dictate, oh, I can do this on my own. And of course, with that degree of openness and with empathy and with support, a level of trust can develop. And with trust comes the opportunity of transformation. The last of my seven summits was Mount Everest, 29,034 feet above sea level, where the oxygen concentration is only approximately one-third of that at the oceans. From base camp to camp one, we have to travel through the icefall across a myriad of crevasses. Just a scene on the way into Everest. So let me back up to the icefall. Partly across crevasses, but the question is how, with cramp on feet and aluminum ladder rungs? Before coming, I had heard that one of the stronger climbers from a previous climb, Vincent Massif, in 2005, actually had quit his climb on Everest. And he was saying, this mountain is insane. I'd also heard that another one of my buddies had literally crawled on his belly across every single one of the crevasses. The question that haunted each of us is, what do we do when we lose our balance? What happens when the ladders start swaying? What happens when we fall? What's the possibility of rescue when crevasses are th hundreds and hundreds of feet in depth? Everybody was apprehensive. Just another word for fear, except for the guides. They kept saying, oh, relax. It took us 10 days to get to base camp. 10 days? Yeah, the body had to acclimatize. The chemistry of the body has to change to adapt to the much lower oxygen levels at base camp at 17,600 feet. The very next day, we got to work. We had to form cohesive, interdependent teams. We had to become comfortable with carabiner use, crevasse rescue, and rope travel. And of course, we had to become comfortable with the ladders. We practiced, and we practiced, and we practiced. And that actually reminds me of a quote by Jean Zimmerman, a noted author, and she said, the art of the hero is not about being brave. It is more about being so competent that bravery isn't even an issue. Each of us knew that approaching this environment, we would be encountering unexpected um, situations and uncontrolled situations. Think for a moment of getting to the icefall and needing to climb through these crevasses or through avalanches cascading down the mountainside at any point in time, or even needing to cross crevasses, some with ladders, ladders some without ladders. We had each come with one goal in mind, to get to the top safely. However, also with the willingness to deal with every situation that we encountered along the journey. 50 days later, yes, 5-0, I'm standing on top of the world, on top of Mount Everest. And in that moment, I learned that overcoming fear and stepping into freedom has everything to do with preparation, but it also has everything to do with knowing that the mindset of fear is just a switch, a thought switch, away from the debilitating alternative of constriction and fear. When the mountain threw curveballs at me, I had learned that being negative was absolutely futile. 
How often do you, in your everyday life, point a finger when something doesn't go right? Somebody or something, even an inanimate object, doesn't perform as you wish it to perform. And you blame it for your misery? Something goes wrong and we go into a huff. Does it really need to be that way? When you realize that you can experience a newfound freedom, it is priceless. Let me repeat that. When you realize that you can experience a newfound freedom, a freedom in which you're not caught up by your reactions or your emotions, that is priceless. Now I realize that this state of self-awareness and self-control might not always be easy to attain. However, in those moments, what you and I need to do, we need to call time out on being stuck. We need to start tuning into what is the internal conversation? What is our self-talk? What are we saying to ourselves? How rational is this? And then switch it from the irrational to the rational. In other words, step out of fear into the expansion of freedom. And far more important, stepping into our own personal power. Now, there are many paths that can take us to this level of equanimity, which of course is our birthright. Everyone on this planet should have the opportunity for that experience. I had many insights and certainly faced many of my fears on the mountains of the world. You might say, hmm, that's a little bit extreme. And I would say to you, maybe. At the same time, this level of intensity has the possibility of spiraling you and I to a discovery of who we really are. And when we know who we are and we accept our limitations and we embrace and appreciate our strengths, we have the opportunity of being better people and as a result of that, of course, better leaders. The unfortunate part is many people don't even know paths like this exist. And what's even more un unfortunate is when we know that a path or paths like this exist and we don't take it because we say, oh, that's not for me. Because our fear has stopped us moving into the unknown. I am convinced that when you and I and this planet are supposed to survive, we have to overcome our fears. We have to embrace freedom. And we have to seek to move into a higher level of being so that our own goals and our own dreams are far more easily achieved. The challenge is how to have the courage to truly discover and embrace our own magnificence. And of course, from this point, step into freedom and into much greater effectiveness and even more happiness, which is really what we all want for each other. Like I, I'm going to encourage you to go and fly your kite on the summit of your Mount Everest.